friends, and welcome to a very special Buddy Read reading vlog. I was finishing up editing this vlog and I realized that I hadn't filmed an intro. <laughs> I think I got a little confused because I was filming a different vlog around the same time and just got a little lost in all the, the chaos. So as the title suggests, me and Stephanie, my best friend, are going to be reading Six Crimson Cranes together in this vlog. We currently live in different cities, but we like to read the same book every now and then and talk about it. And at the end of this video, there will be a video chat discussion between the two of us where we talk about elements that we really enjoyed about the book and the book as a whole. So that section will be a little bit spoilery, just a heads up, but I will be vlogging for a little bit before that. So if you're curious about Six Crimson Cranes, spoiler alert, we both really liked it. I would definitely recommend watching this video. This book follows a young princess named Shiori who has magic, but in a land where magic is forbidden. And this gets her in a bit of trouble with her stepmother who places a curse on her and her six brothers. The brothers end up turning into cranes and Shiori is cursed to not be able to speak. And for every word that passes through her lips, one of her brothers will die. So she has to sort of make it back through the world on her own and it's a really lovely story. It's a reimagining of a couple different fairy tales and I just think it was so beautiful and this was a lovely tale. I'm going to send it back to a younger blonder version of myself and uh, get the rest of this vlog going so stay tuned. Hello! Um, whoop, I almost dropped my book on my cat. I am uh, eight chapters in to Six Crimson Cranes, page 82. And I'm liking it a lot so far. Her brother just got turned into cranes. Uh, not a spoiler alert. That is in the book description. So uh, that was a lot. But I really like Shiori as a main character. I think she is very brave. Uh, <laughs> there's a scene where she's following someone and it's like very dangerous. And I'm just like, girl, what are you doing? But um, I like her a lot. She's, you know, stubborn, headstrong princess type, which is always a favorite trope of mine. I really like she's got a friend that turned like is a dragon, but he can take a human form and he's really funny. I like him a lot. And she's got this paper crane that she enchanted and it talks, but like it didn't talk at first. So when it started speaking, I was listening to it in my car and I was like, Kiki talks! And it was adorable. The audiobook narrator does a really cute voice for Kiki and it's so precious. So yeah, I'm liking this a lot so far. It is a really fast read. It reads like a little bit younger on the young adult side, but I'm totally fine with that. It's like a fairy tale, you know, it's, it's hard to be mad. Plus the main character is like 16 and I would say she feels 16 because sometimes you get YA books where the character is like 16 or 17 years old but they act like they're in their mid-20s. I think the author had a difficult job in trying to establish sort of the relationship between Shiori and her six brothers in just a handful of chapters before the curse starts because you need to feel like a degree of empathy for them and for her and for their situation. A couple of them sort of blend together for me, but like at least three of them stand out as individual characters with their own different dynamics with Shiori. And I like that. And I think Elizabeth Lim did a good job with that. And I'm curious to see how that develops. I'm going to be so upset if any of her brothers actually die. That's part of the curse is if she talks with each word that comes out of her mouth, one of her brothers will die. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, man... If it's the oldest, I'll be upset. If it's the youngest, I'll be upset. I don't know if there's gonna be any order to this, but like, she just fucked. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited to see where we go from here now that she's sort of just starting out on the, the real main action and adventure of the story. She's cursed to not talk, so like, don't know how she's gonna get around and do stuff, but I'm curious to find out. This is so cute so far. I just want to take a second to um, appreciate this special edition of Six Crimson Cranes. This is the Fairy Loot Edition, and I have a whole unboxing video I will link up here if you want to watch it, um, that it, where I unbox this book with all the items it came with. 
but this is gorgeous. This is the UK edition, and I actually also really like the US edition as well. I think both cover arts are just absolutely gorgeous. There's also artwork on the inside cover on both the hardback. There's an embossed cover of Shiori with her Crane brothers, I'm assuming. And then on the inside of the dust jacket, it's Shiori, her paper crane kiki. Um, I'm assuming this is um, the dragon whose name I'm forgetting at the moment. Sir you, Sir you, I think. And I believe this is the guy that she was betrothed to in the beginning, but we haven't actually met yet. And I just, I love when they include like character art, because sometimes it can be really difficult to visualize what people are meant to look like. Um, and this is just such a nice little um, sort of cheat, I guess. <laughs> Plus this artwork is beautiful. I believe this was illustrated by um, at Salties from Instagram. I will put their handle on the screen so you can see and follow. I really like their style. And then there's also this print that has a note from the author on one side and then Shiori and I thought that was gonna be Kiki but Kiki doesn't glow so I don't know. I don't think I've gotten to the point that this part is illustrating but just gorgeous gorgeous character artwork and I'm a fan and this edition is absolutely gorgeous and it's it's just so lovely. I'm currently vlogging two different things at the same time and I'm gonna get the footage all mixed up. I just know it. Anyways, um, I'm about 19 chapters into Six Crimson Cranes and I'm loving it so far. Oh my gosh, it's such a fun adventure story and I'm reading it and I don't know if it's the fairy tale aspect of it or what, but I need this to be an animated movie like now. <laughs> it is just so vividly described and like I can just picture it as an animated movie in my head and I just think that would be so cute and wonderful. But yeah, loving it so far. Stephanie is like a freaking speed reader and she's on chapter 29 at least. Last time I checked at least, she's on chapter 29, which is a full 10 chapters ahead of me. So I've got some reading to do. Gotta bust my butt a little bit tonight. I gotta edit a video and then hopefully spend the rest of the night reading because I'm super invested. I'm really curious to see what happens and how the heck they're gonna break this spell. I think Elizabeth Lim has done a really great job at weaving this really intricate tale that doesn't feel bog bogged down by like each step you have to take. It feels like we're really working towards something. And I love the dynamic between Shiori and her brothers. And I, I can't say too much because I don't wanna spoil anything, but it's just like, it's so touching. And the curse really feels like super high stakes, you know? If she makes a sound, it's not even speaking, if she like screams, one of them will die. And that's so intense, especially for like a YA book. And you can tell her brothers mean a lot to her. So uh, I'm gonna be so heartbroken if one of them actually dies, I'm gonna lose it. Also potential love triangle question mark, perhaps? She hasn't had a whole lot of interaction with the dragon guy. And then she finds out her betrothed to Khan is like actually super nice, but he doesn't know who she is. So you can see these connections she's starting to form with these guys and I'm very curious to see how that's going to develop. I'm having such a fun time with literally every aspect of this book and I hope it keeps up because I'm loving it so far. And I can't wait to see what Stephanie thinks. I'm, from the glimpses that I've gotten from her Snapchats and like quick little back and forth conversation we've had, it does seem like she's also really enjoying it. She, she sent me a text earlier that was like, oh my God, chapter 29. And I'm like, I am on chapter 19, chill out. So I'm very curious to see what chapter 29 entails and what's got her freaked out. So, uh, but yeah, so stay tuned. I think I'm gonna go get some boba. I just got out of work and I'm feeling boba and then I gotta edit a video, but then right into reading cause I'm invested. finished six crimson cranes it was so good there were definitely elements about the end that I kind of expected or predicted and even though I kind of had a feeling things were gonna turn out a certain way 
it was still written really beautifully, and it was such a lovely journey. Oh my gosh. I had no idea until the other day when I was talking to Stephanie about it that this is actually, like, part of a series. I don't know if it's going to be a duology or a trilogy or what. I know Elizabeth Lim's other books are duologies, but this one definitely had an ending that will lead into another book for sure. So I'm really excited to see where the book, the next book goes. Ah, that was such a lovely story. It was like such a captivating, fast read too. I really enjoyed that. I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Stephanie tomorrow. And I'm so glad we buddy read this together. This is something that, this is the type of story that we both love. And I'm really glad it worked out that way because I wasn't sure before we ended up picking it up she just happened to sort of also buy the book. And then we were like, hey, we both have this book. We should read it together. So uh, what a lovely book to read with my best friends. I loved that. Uh, so stay tuned. I say stay tuned for tomorrow. Like you guys are gonna have to wait a full like 12 hours. <laughs> it's me. I have to wait a full 12 hours. But yeah, so uh, I have a hair appointment tomorrow. But then afterwards, I'll be catching up with Stephanie to figure out her thoughts and I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, are you ready to discuss Six Crimson Cranes? I am. Okay. Thoughts, feelings, first impressions? Yes, first impression from then when I finished it. Like, first impression, it was like, this is a really cool story. I, it's interesting reading the flap and thinking that you know a lot of what's going on and then reading it and being like, oh, I actually have no idea where this is going from where I thought it was going to go. Um, thoughts after finishing it, I am devastated in the best way possible um I love this universe I want to pick up more of Elizabeth Lim's books because they're like if if this is anything to go off of like I want all of them now <laughs> yeah I, I own Spin the Dawn which I believe was maybe her debut uh but I haven't gotten to it yet but now I'm much more eager to pick that up like as soon as possible and I was saying last night both to you and vlogging that I'm so glad we read this together because I think it's the exact type of story we both really love. There's that like fairy tale element to it. There's romance, there's adventure, there's like a great familial aspect to it as well. And I just had such a fun time reading this. Like maybe 50 to 100 pages in, I was like, I need this to be an animated movie. I want like a web comic. I want like I want all the adaptations of this. It was like a perfect fairy tale retelling, in my opinion. Yeah, it's definitely something special when you have a story that not only is the world building really good, but the world building makes it in such a way that you feel nostalgia for a place you've never been to. Like as things are being described, it's like kind of what you're saying, like, I want to see it animated, like I want to see it, I want to be able to experience it because the details are just so beautiful. I know I definitely made a point to mention to you that the food descriptions were really good. And so I could have just eaten a meal and after reading some of these chapters, it's like, oh, I want to try that and I want to try that and I want that as well. I know, I need monkey cakes in my life now. I thought Elizabeth Lim did a really great job at balancing like, it wasn't very purple prose. Like it was very straightforward writing, but like she still managed to capture i think like the culture of kiata very well i don't know it was it was so beautiful so many feelings for this whole book i wasn't i like went into it not knowing a whole lot about it so i was like okay like let's see where this is gonna go but i have never i don't think i've enjoyed a story so much even though it like really took me on the roller coaster of emotions I know, I was very invested, like, from beginning to end and in, in this journey and her relationship with her brothers. I think it was probably very difficult where her brothers spend so little page time uh, not as cranes to really establish both their personalities and their individual relationship and dynamic with Shiori. And I think she did a great job at that. It, like, maybe not all the brothers. The middle ones are kind of, like, they blend in a little bit together for me, but definitely her two eldest brothers, Benkai, Andahai, and um, Hasho. Yeah, I think she had a pretty well-established relationship with those three brothers, and it, it definitely made the emotional impact of their curse hit a lot heavier. And I wanted to get on a point with the brothers especially. I think there's what you're talking about with 
we get a little screen time of them not as cranes and as we're at the beginning of the novel and uh Shuri's like I don't want to get married I don't want to live away from my family I have this very intimate bond with them like this will be my last festival well, and she feels herself drifting from them as well which is really heartbreaking the struggle of like what your expectations are of like there will be a point where you don't get to live with them and you want to be able to like maintain those memories and then to have your brothers turned into cranes and then have like you are able to reunite with them at one point but still that same sort of i'm with you in a way that i wasn't expecting because i found you but i still have to experience that separation and it just like yeah that pain all the more present yeah, and like as horrible as the curse was, like it did bring them together again in a in a weird way. Whenever like Shiori was in danger and they as cranes would like flock to her rescue, I got so emotional. <laughs> Cause it's like that must be so hard to like be limited to your crane abilities, but like seeing your sister in desperate danger, like, oh my god, there was this this whole story felt very high stakes, like, and I think she did a great job at writing it in that way. Like, the entire time, objectively, I was like, she's not going to kill one of the brothers off. There were moments where I was like, I swear to God, if Hasho or Andahai or Benkai dies, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> um, it's like, it was so terrifying whenever they did go to save her, depending on the time of day, because it's like, oh gosh, are you going to turn into a human? But then also, as you're wondering, like, she's not going to do it is she gonna do it i was i was literally at work i was like trying to like put logic to what would happen i was like would it choose a brother randomly would it choose the oldest brother same i was going through the same process because like she had a very strong connection to both her eldest and youngest brother so if it went like by age it would have really i mean losing any of her brothers would have suffered but like those were two of the ones that the audience was the most familiar with so like it would have hurt really bad i'm, I'm glad it didn't play out that way <laughs> It's, it's really funny to think about where, like, which brothers are highlighted the most, because it's true, like, the other, like, middle three aren't quite mentioned as much, because, like, you have the twins, and, like, that's an inseparable pair, like, amazing. But then, I think it's with uh, Reiji, they're, um, before they depart again, and she's like, teach me how to fight, and all the other brothers are like, no, why are you gonna do it? And he's like, like move over like I'll do it even though he doesn't get a lot of screen time like that really endeared me to <laughs> no exactly exactly I thought the same thing it was like even the brothers that she didn't have as much on screen time with I think there would like Elizabeth Lim did a really good job of at least having one or two emotional moments with them so that if any of them had died you would have been really upset and really feel for Shiori so yeah I really loved the sibling dynamic I also loved that her name meant not and like the whole like that was like she was what held the entire family together and like brought all the siblings together and there's like the whole like strength in their sibling relationship was just so beautifully written it made me very emotional the entire way through so pivoting a little bit from sort of the family relationships one of the big things about this going into it that i was expecting especially based off of the fairy loot sort of special edition the inside of the dust jacket um, I was like, ooh, there's gonna be a love triangle, um, which normally I am a simp for. I love a good <laughs> love triangle, and I know we've discussed this, but a lot of the times I, I usually end up sort of rooting for the, the underdog a little bit in, in those situations, or the, the least obvious uh, choice in, in that, but this time around, I was really attached to Takan, who was her betrothed, and they end up meeting later in the novel because their betrothal ceremony doesn't really quite go to plan. But he was just like the perfect soft boy, and like, I really appreciated that no matter what Sarina and Hasage were trying to say about her, Takan was loyal to a fault for Shiori, like before he even knew who she was. And I just like, that, that touched me so deeply, I don't know, just the fact that she had that in their relationship that, that she could count on him in that sort of way both Takan and Magari actually like she formed these really strong bonds with and they were so loyal to her it was so nice to see because I feel like that's a really easy source of drama within a love interest is sort of that like oh you betrayed me or like this misunderstanding and like that never happened in this and I and I loved that for that you know um, her relationship with Takan was really sweet, and I swear if in the next book anything threatens that, I'm sorry, Saryu, but, like, I'm not interested. Well, because, like, I know for the beginning when I was reading it, 
you don't really get a glimpse of Chacon for a really long time. Just by like default, you're like already kind of leaning one way uh, with Sarah you. And then as you like start to get to a point where it's like, okay, like we've got these two people. I remember before you really get into her being an Ido, it's like, oh no, I don't know how I feel. Like I like both of them. But as soon as she's there, like my whole view shifted completely. And it's funny to think about how a lot of times within romance, especially within love triangles, how a lot of the times it's a misunderstanding, like you said. And it's like, in this case, I think it's funny where it's like, it's not even a misunderstanding about how she felt about him because he was straight up telling her like, yeah, she like didn't really like me at all. And like for him to know that, to see like, I'm sending these letters and you are just not responding to them. But then to still be like, no, like I can still see a chance like that like shots to the well, heart. I was- I think like after that meeting that they had before she realized who he was when they were children at the festival, like his experience getting to know her a little bit more assured him that like, it wasn't personal. Like she wasn't ignoring his letters because she hated him specifically. It was the idea that she just hated being betrothed. And so like he was able to see past like the resentment she had for, for him and like see that it was more about the situation and that they could have something because they did get along very well and so i just it was so cute we were talking about how lovely it is that her name signifies not and like keeping it together or like keeping her family together when he's like confessing his feelings essentially he like also brings in that imagery i want to tie my knot to yours or my string to yours or something oh my god i was just like wow his confessions were everything like there was like two times where he was really like i have feelings for you and both times i was like ah <laughs> screaming into a pillow the, the winter festival scene like that's the only part that i was able to remember to mark off where he's like going through and doing this beautiful story making eye contact with her at the end but then also like as she's going through this and at the beginning of the book where she's like i could never see myself loving a place like this and as everything is falling like into place this is the most beautiful place in the world and it was just like how oh my god i like i can't even like verbalize how much i love that we see the conflict with what could be this love triangle where it's like when we see siryu for the first time and just before the curse happens where it's like no, there's like this like nice and fun banter between them. Well, and he teaches her magic, which I think is a big deal. Like that's a really significant moment. And I think like, yeah, it would be easy for her to sort of develop feelings for him in any other circumstance. It did have like this very playful banter, which was fun. I enjoyed that for sure. I'm just so nervous. I'm excited. But I'm so nervous about what book two is going to bring with that. Like I said yesterday, I was like kind of around this point towards the end when I realized that it wasn't a standalone and I was very devastated. Do you want to talk a little bit about Raikama? Because she was a really central figure to this story. And I, I have to say, I really enjoyed the sort of twist on the evil stepmother trope. I was really, I appreciated it so much. And like, I, I feel like whenever I'm reading books, even when they're really emotionally hitting, it's like my heart cries, but I don't always like actually cry when I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, but the feels physically manifested this time <laughs> into actual tears as I was reading, because it really is like, it, she set it up in such a way. And there are readers who would probably pick this book up and be like, no, I think I know exactly where she's going with it. I'm going to say I had a feeling early on that I was like, I don't think this is what it looks like. I definitely say, or I could definitely say it was pretty convincing what she already witnessed. Like I can totally see why she would be really freaked out by that situation. As time went on with the curse and the bowl on her head concealing the magic, which every time I remember there's a bowl on her head for the majority of this book, I'm like, this is so ridiculous. Which is funny because especially like with the inside of your jacket where it's like, <laughs> if you're picking it up, you're like, you would never guess that like our main protagonist is going to have a walnut on her, like a walnut bowl on her head. But what I was going to say is that she did a video where she talks about the different stories that are influenced in this. And one of them is a story about somebody who has a walnut bowl on their head. And now I really want to read that because I didn't know that. Again, I think she like tackled the fairy tale feeling very well in this. Cause yeah, that is, and I, I think it was cute that it, it got a little meta at one point with Magari specifically talking to her as, um, you know, before everyone knew she was Shiori uh that oh Takan like must like you because you remind him of one of his stories and because like he's really into fairy tales too and <laughs> I was just like oh that's so sweet I think it's one of those things where like as you're reading the story and you are watching Shiori or reading Shiori in real time being like 
her hesitation with like, hmm, is this actually all I think it is? I think that's when I like, that was when I started to think about it because all of the like really archetypal bits for an evil stepmother are there. Like you have somebody that you don't like. She literally has snakes everywhere. So like you are already predisposed to be like, oh no. She's very secretive. But then as she's questioning it, where she's like, well, she wanted us gone. Why didn't she just kill us? But also, there, how many fairy tales are there where someone, like, goes through this really weird ordeal when, like, the person who cursed them could have just killed them? I think there's a really interesting bit where it's, like, you can still enjoy the fairy tales that we have and, like, the bits and the details that are, like, this is just how it is. Like, there's no why this happens. This is just something to accept with the fairy tale. But the book does a really interesting thing where it says, it's okay to put those questions in and wonder why somebody does something because then you get to the result that happens where Rikoma loved her the whole time. When the reveal happens, not just of like her being good, but when it happens where all of the memories she has of her mom were really Rikoma, I bawled. I was like, this is, because you, you're reading the story and you're like, lost her mom really young and yet has all these vivid memories. Like, I really think throughout the book, I was like, you must have a really good memory if you were that young. And then it's like, no, it's because it was her instead. Like, uh, One more thing I definitely want to mention before we wrap this up is, uh, so we, we find out towards the end that the source of Rekama's sorcery, her power is a corrupted dragon pearl that her actual sister was born with, but apparently it did belong to a dragon. So I'm very curious to see how that plays out because if she was born with it, how was it taken from the dragon? I'm, I'm very, like, obviously this is more like book two questions, but I'm very curious to see how that plays out and how they figure out who the dragon pearl belongs to. You know what it made me think of? Inuyasha. I haven't seen Inuyasha. No, the whole prep, like the whole thing at the beginning, like you could literally just get the first manga volume is that Kagome has this shark, the Shikon Jewel, and the only reason that it's like in her, because you know, the whole demon comes up and takes it out of her is because she is the reincarnation of Kikyo. And so when you were saying like, how is it that this person would have been born with it? It really lends to a lot of different questions of like, well, what happened? I mean, there is a lot of talk about reincarnation in it within the story, specifically about that moon goddess. Um, so that's, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. I literally just thought about it now. As soon as you said that she, the, her sister was born with it, I was like, Inuyasha, Kagome, Kikyo, Shikon Jewel. Instead, it's just a dragon pearl. I mean, I don't know. We don't know where like the, what the source of the dragon pearls are either. So I'm, I am so excited for book two. This was such a great first book. And again, I think it was really the perfect fairy tale retelling because it, it, it had that feeling of being a fairy tale and specifically one that's like not super well known as well so it's not like Beauty and the Beast where you're fighting sort of your audience's preconception of the story but it still maintained that fairy tale feeling and I just thought that was so lovely and again just the perfect blend of adventure and romance and family ties and a really significant amount of character growth as well and I just this was such a wonderful YA fantasy book I I am I am so pleased with it perhaps unnecessarily uh what what I want to ask what did you rate this book I forget that I have a Goodreads account now so I can actually post it this is like a five out of five for me like I really enjoyed this book. I think everything was done really well. You made a point to mention that like, I think what you said, like purple writing, I've never actually heard of that. Purple prose, yeah. Um, flowery. Um, it's something where for me, the writing, while it's not purple prose, it's like still very beautiful, still really hits the point home. The characters are done so well. The twist, while you can still, like, you have an anticipation of seeing them, I feel like they still hit the way that they were intended to. Yeah, you're still super invested in this whole story, and that's hard to capture, I think. So I thought Elizabeth Lim did an amazing job. Yeah, and as to the last point you said as well, where when you have a story that's based off of a really common fairy tale for you and your upbringing, it's, like, really hard to combat against what you already have, especially with something like Beauty and the Beast, for example, where there's like a billion retellings. I'm seeing that the stories that were based off of it, some of them I was familiar with, but some of the fairy tales I wasn't. So it really makes me, as somebody who didn't grow up with these stories, want to go and read them and see what the things that she took from them were. Um, yeah. Five out of five. I really love this book. Me too. I, I also gave this a five out of five on Goodreads. 
Um, if I were to nitpick, it would probably be a 4.5, but I think just the feeling that I, I walked away with afterwards is like, it's worthy of the five stars. So. <laughs> But yeah, so again, I'm, I'm so glad we read this together. I think it was the perfect book to buddy read, honestly. I always love our discussions about books after the fact as well. So I'm going to wrap up the vlog here. So thank you again so much and thank aud the audience for watching along. Feel free to comment yourself down below. Have you read this book or like what were your thoughts and feelings? I would love to hear them because obviously Stephanie and I liked it a lot, but we're always willing to discuss more, so get in the comments. Um, but otherwise, feel free to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and have a wonderful day. Bye.